Hello and welcome to worship here at Sweetwater Christian Church. We are so glad to have you. Merry Christmas. Uh, today is the 26th and while we're not meeting in person, we hope that you are with family or just enjoying a great Christmas season as we gather in our homes uh, to worship today. We're so glad that you're here. We have a kind of interesting and unique service set up for you today. So let me kind of prepare you for what you're about to see and kind of set it up for us here. Uh, what we've done is a few of us, uh, my brother and Chris Henderson, y'all's worship pastor and myself, uh, form a group called The True Tellings, and we have done a second volume of our Advent sessions. So what you're going to see is a musical piece that has a few Christmas carols that hopefully you'll recognize, and a narration that goes over those that just tells the story of the waiting and the longing for the birth of Christ and the hope that that brings, um, but also it, it also recognizes the reality that there's still that sense of longing that we have, that sense of kind of hope hopelessness that we sense sometimes, but then the great ability that we have to trust in Jesus and the rejoicing that that brings out in us. So that's the first little bit of the video. And then the following part of the video that kind of sums up the True Telling's Advent sessions for this year is a rendition of I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, which is a beautiful, haunting, but also hope-filled hymn that I'm sure some of you know. And if you don't know, I'm, I'm looking forward to introducing that to you. So without further ado, here's the True Telling's Advent Sessions, Volume 2. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, for the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Silence, four centuries old, rings in the ears of the children of Israel. Foreign powers reign once again, carrying the spirit of all the empires of her captivity. The temple looms over Jerusalem, a hollow reminder of the great kings and prophets of old. The stagnant waters of purification and the endless cycle of sacrifices do not unlock the heavens or unleash a king to destroy Israel's enemies. Instead, the powerful grow more so while the hungry and poor wait for the waters of healing to be stirred. Echoes of a prince who would be king feel as far away as their father Abraham. The consolation of Israel seems but wishful thinking to a people walking in darkness. Israel the captive shakes under the weight of her fetters. Where is the one who can bear David's crown and offer signs like Elijah? Oppression has beaten them down into the dust from which they came. But now, that same dust swirls in the days of Caesar Augustus through the streets of David's city as something moves toward Bethlehem. In the fullness of time, the desire of nations will take in a breath. The rod of Jesse speaks, let there be light to the people who have walked in darkness. The center holds as 400 years of silence finally cracks open to the sound of new birth. The king is coming. But this is not as we expected. 
What sort of king is this? A child. Born into a world with promises of peace on earth and goodwill to all, even as wars rage and evil plows ever onward. How is this the answer to the age-old riddle? How will he establish justice on the earth from a cattle stall? Where is the scepter we were promised? The one who would fill us with good things and end our oppression? The great shepherd and guardian of us all now lays helpless, guarded by shepherds. The creator naps among the creation. Here is the king of kings, the word made flesh, the son of Mary. Very God of very God, the fullness of time now come, the curtain of the world stage pulled back. Quietly sleeps the one who wears the crown. The Virgin's lullaby reminds the world that the poor are not forgotten and that the promises made to Abraham still hold sway. Israel's strength and consolation the great hope of the world has come. For this is the great paradox, the creator of all now present within the creation. Emmanuel, born to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the one who tramples over death through victorious love. So blessed are the poor, the meek, the brokenhearted, the captive, the persecuted, and those full of dismay, for they have all now seen God. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and his name is Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Make no mistake, the government is on his shoulders, the scepter is in his right hand. He has conquered with love, destroying death to set his people free. So do not be afraid, good tidings of great joy are yours. Comfort poured over you as the sun rises with healing in its wings. So once again we say, come, O oh come, Emmanuel. Make the sad things come untrue. Make the crooked path straight beneath our feet and guide us in the way of peace. Set the broken bones and bind up the wounds. Proclaim once again good news the world over as your people rejoice. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, for the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Peace. 
Well, we hope that you enjoyed that video. I uh, hope that it was encouraging to you or maybe kind of brought out some things that are good for us to remember in this season and filled us with hope and the joy and just the reality that Jesus is present with us even now. So to that end, uh, let's, let's jump into the scriptures together this morning. I, uh, to be honest with y'all, I was going to preach on a really dark passage, but then I decided maybe not in good taste the day after Christmas. So to that end, let's, um, we're going to read from John chapter 1, which is a great place to kind of land in the Christmas season because it talks about the reality that God came down to us and is present with us and lived life as a human being and understands what it is to be human and understands pain and suffering and loss, but also hope and joy and friendship and all of those things. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your phone, go ahead and open up to John chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to read a few verses together. So here we go. This is John chapter one, verse one. It says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made and without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Some of your translations may even say the darkness has not understood it. Verse six says this, there was a man sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was, was made or created through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. 
John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of, the full, out of his fullness, we've all received grace in place of grace that is already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came from Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, he has made him known. It's John chapter 1. Verses 1 through 18, this, this passage is well known. I'm not, gonna, I'm not trying to say anything that you guys haven't heard before, but it seemed appropriate to kind of land here after Christmas as we continue to ponder the reality of the incarnation and ponder the reality that the God of the universe, we're told that this God through whom Jesus, through whom all things were made, <laughs> that God's great plan to, in God's infinite wisdom, God decided it was a good idea to come down and be with us that that was the great solution, that that was the answer to everything, was to come down and be present with his creation in order to redeem it. And so there's a few things that this passage tells us. One, it tells us kind of obviously, and that is that God is not far off. God is not a far off, distant, kind of disconnected being. No, 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 God is very personal. God is very present. God is very aware of what it means to be human and what it means to be in this world, which... Again, sounds kind of obvious that you're like, Lorian, I've heard that before. That's kind of the message of Christianity. But, but have you really thought about it recently? I mean, this is, this is earth shattering. This is worth all of our attention and all of our energy that we just pour back into the things of God because of what God has done, because God is close. He's not far off. He's not kind of, if, if we just keep trying harder, if we just keep searching harder, if we just can make it to the crest of the next hill, then we'll see God. No, no, no. God has already made himself known through Jesus. And so that's kind of the first thing the text tells us is that God is present. The creator of the universe, of the cosmos, of the galaxies that are swirling and growing and expanding and contracting, even as we speak, knows what it is to be a human being. and knows what it is to feel pain and joy and all the things that we kind of just, even perhaps in a 24-hour period, can experience. So the first thing is that God is present God knows us, God knows our predicaments, God knows our joys and our sorrows. And here's the other thing. God not only has come into the world, but God has come into the world and wasn't passive about it. We're told in verse five that the light has shined into the darkness. God did something, Jesus did something when he was here. He didn't come just as a mere observer, kind of just casually looking around and going, well, there's that and there's that. No, 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 he came and did something about our predicament. We're told that the light has shined into the darkness and the darkness has not overcome, or maybe like I said earlier, some translations say understood it. It kind of is reminiscent of Plato's cave allegory. I'm sure some of you know it. If you don't, it's totally fine. No worries. But uh, this, this great kind of story that Plato tells is that there's these people and they're, they're in shackles and they're chained and all they can do is face the stone that's in front of them in this cave. They're not facing the entrance, they're facing towards the back of it. Their faces are up against stone and there's a fire behind them, much like this beautiful Christmas tree behind me, and it's illuminating their shadows onto the stone. But that's all they can see, that's reality, just this shadowy, dark existence. And eventually one of them is able to escape and kind of get out of the cave and he goes to the surface and he begins to see light and shapes and colors and things that aren't just shadows. And then he goes back down to the cave and the people that are there are like, you're crazy. (laughs) You're crazy. This is reality. This stone that's in front of my face with shadows is reality. That's kind of a truncated version of it, but that gets the point across, I think. But we're told in the scriptures that Jesus has come into the darkness and that even the darkness does not understand it, but also cannot overcome him. So not only is God present with us and God came near and kind of is close to us, but God also has done something about our predicament. It wasn't a passive kind of existence in Galilee for 33 years. It was more of an active, I'm going to do something. God is on the move in the business of reconciling and healing the creation. This is good news. This is a good Christmas message, I think. Much, much better than the dark sermon that I had planned on preaching. Praise God for his mercy, right? But then we're told that John comes to proclaim the way to kind of get the people ready. And then we're told in verse 12 that to those who receive Jesus, to those who say yes to the king, who proclaim their allegiance to his kingdom, 
that he has given those people the right to become children of God. And these people are, these people are different. They're born of God. Something has happened to them. Again, God has come near and God has done something about our predicament and now we are changing because of it. Christmas, friends, is not something that leaves us the same. You can't experience what happens at Christmas and just kind of walk away and be like, yeah, I believe in that, but it doesn't really change anything about my life. That's not really an option that is on the table before us because we're told right here, that people who say yes to this are now people who are born of God. Later in John's gospel, just a few pages over, Jesus has this mind-blowing conversation with Nicodemus where he tells Nicodemus, he says, unless you are born again, unless you experience this radical life transformation through the power of the Spirit and in the name of Jesus, your life isn't going to change much. Your life is going to kind of stagnate and stay the same. And Jesus is offering us something that we cannot obtain on our own. So God comes near. God does something about our predicament. And then there is a response that is elicited in us in response and in just recognition of what God has done. And it's beautiful and it's encouraging and it's also challenging and it's hard sometimes. But, but friends, it is worth all of it. Why? The why for this comes at the end. It comes in verse 18, where it says that no one has ever seen God. That is a bold statement for John to make. That is a very bold statement. Because if you think with me about the Old Testament, there's a lot of times in the Old Testament where people see God, right? You have Moses and the elders of Israel. We're told that they see God. We're told that Elijah gets kind of a glimpse. We're told that Isaiah in chapter six, that Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up and exalted the train of his robe filling the temple, all of those things. We're told in the Old Testament a lot of times that someone or a group of people has seen God. So for John to kind of burst on the scene with the New Testament and say, no one has ever seen God is a bold statement, but he's able to back it up. And here's what he says in response to that statement. He says, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son That's Jesus, that's the word made flesh, that's the God who has come into this world to do something about our predicament and to offer us a new way of life, who is himself God. So Jesus is God, radical statement. And Jesus is also the one who is in closest relationship with the Father. And he says that this Jesus, this word made flesh, this baby in the manger, the son of Mary, the constellation of Israel, all those beautiful things, says that he has made God known. So John is making this radical statement and he's basically saying kind of in modern vernacular that only when you look at Jesus, do you really see God? Only when we look at Jesus, at the fullness of who he is, at the exact representation of God's nature that he gives us, do we accurately see a picture of God? So only in a God that is close to us, only in a God that suffers with us, only in a God that became human, do we actually see what God is truly like? That's radical. That's mind blowing. And we kind of get get used to it and we're kind of getting comfortable with it, especially if you've grown up in church. But let me just present to you friends that that is just earth shattering good news. There's two other places in the New Testament that speak to this. Um, One of them is is the book of Colossians and one of them is the book of Hebrews. So let me kind of flip over there real quick. And I'm going to read these passages uh, because I think that they're really helpful in helping us cement this idea. One, that Jesus is God, which we should remember and we should be careful how we speak about because I talk to so many people who, who forget that Jesus is God. Like good Christian people who grow up in church who have forgotten somehow along the way that Jesus is God. He's not just a good human. He's not just someone who kind of came on the scene that God picked. No, he actually is God. Colossians speaks to this in chapter one, verse 15. It says this, the son, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, both visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. Verse 19, here's the key. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus 
and through Jesus to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. There it is again. There is this reality that Jesus is God and that God is doing something about our predicament, that God is drawn close to us and that there is now an invitation that we are called to receive and do something about. Again, the Christmas message, the good news of the gospel is not a passive experience. It can't be. It requires, it elicits some form of response from us and kind of demands our allegiance or demands us to walk away. You can't kind of be in the middle here. The last passage I'm gonna read is from Hebrews chapter one. This is how the author of Hebrews says basically the same thing, but with different words. It says, in the past, it's talking about the Old Testament, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, the author of Hebrews is speaking like, right when they're writing this, but, but now, which we can kind of translate and pull forward to our time, but now in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. Here's, here's the kicker. The son, Jesus, the word made flesh is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature sustaining all things by his powerful word. So do you see how both John and then Paul and Colossians and then the author of Hebrews are all weaving this story together, all pointing back to Jesus and saying, hey, if you wanna know what God is like, look at Jesus. If you wanna know what God is like, look at Jesus. And that entails the entirety of Jesus's ministry. That entails both looking at God as this humble baby in a manger, the God who is present with us, the God who heals, the God who releases people from captivity, the God who is in the business of setting things right, also the God who understands what it is to suffer, and also the God who is victorious. This is all predicated at this kind of sight that happens in Bethlehem with this baby in the manger that seems really humble and is. But the paradox of that is that this is also the creator of all things and the true representation of the nature of God. So if you wanna know what God is like, look at Jesus. This is the message of the scriptures. This is the entirety of the New Testament really pointing us back to Jesus and saying, this is what it's always been about. It's always been a story of God drawing near to God's people, clear back to the garden of Eden and then the story of Abraham and then Moses in the Old Testament. All of that continually is God drawing near to God's people. It's God being present in the creation. It's God being aware of the sufferings of his people and then inviting us into participating in how he is reconciling all things. So the kind of question before us, I think maybe the call to action for us in this coming week is to maybe meditate on where do you fit into that story? What is God calling you to? What is the part that you are called to play in the great narrative that we are now caught up in? Let's pray. God, thank you for your infinite mercy and for being present with us, even now. God, we confess that sometimes we just get really comfortable with the story of Christmas and with the story of you coming to be with us. So Jesus, would you maybe just kind of shake some of the cobwebs off of that, shake some of our complacency and our familiarity and give us a new vision as we kind of head into the new year and as we kind of wrap up our Christmas celebrations. God, would you give us a fresh vision of what it means to follow you? and of what it means that Jesus is the best and most accurate representation of what God is like. And in the midst of all of that, in the process of all that, God, would you shape us more and more into Jesus's image so that we can reflect him better into the world. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, let me invite you now, uh, wherever you are, if you're at home or with family or wherever you find yourselves to kind of gather the elements of communion. And let's be honest, we all might not have a, a loaf of bread or crackers. So maybe you, you got a little bit of pumpkin bread left over or maybe even like a, a cookie or something. That's okay today. We're gonna, we're gonna take a deep breath and just enjoy being in this season of Christmas. But if you have maybe some grape juice or anything like that, go ahead and get those elements ready for your family and we will celebrate communion together because um, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body and it's broken for you. Take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup and he poured into the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and, and drink this cup and as often as you do, 
you do this all in remembrance of me. And then Paul picks up on this later and says that we do this all in the remembrance of what Jesus has done and we proclaim his death and his resurrection. So as you gather those elements, let me pray. And then I'm going to give you guys a few seconds to to partake of those elements together. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for just the beauty of the gospel, this good news that you came near to us. That's what we're continuing to celebrate in this Christmas season. And we are grateful that we have ways that you've given us signs and places that we can pause and remember and gather as the body of Christ with the church worldwide. So God, we are grateful for that this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for us and all that you continue to do for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and partake of those elements with your families. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for worship today at Sweetwater Christian Church. We will be back in person like normal next week. We hope to see you there. But until then, we wish you a very Merry Christmas and God's richest blessings.